I'd like to welcome you to the June 2020 virtual meeting of the Michigan Depression Glass Society. This is now our third monthly meeting that we've done this virtual element here, and we're trying out new things every month. So we're trying a little bit of new technology, different ways of doing things. So for a program this evening, I actually have uh, a guest of ours that's going to be uh, presenting tonight. So we're trying something out new on Zoom here. Um, you'll see this done on new shows and things all the time, but there's usually a tech person running things and the interviewer and the person talking can just relax and chat. I'm gonna be kind of serving both roles tonight. So we're gonna see how this goes or maybe a few glitches along the way, but we're gonna get through it. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Michael Mayer from the Heise Club. Hi, Michael, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Jonathan, thanks for having me. We're really, really excited to have you. I know our club has had quite a few guest presenters. We usually try to get one in every year. So we've had people come and talk about Stretch Glass, uh, Cambridge Glass, and finally we're on Heise tonight. So I'm really excited to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of your, your background in Heise? And I know there's a little bit of a family connection as well. Correct. So um, my great-grandfather and grandfather both worked at Heise's here in North Ohio. Um, didn't really know what it was when I was growing up and um, you know my mom you know, said, well, you know, your, your grandpa and great grandpa worked there. And so it was a neat connection for me as an early collector. Um, I initially kind of felt like Heise was in my blood long before it was under my skin of collecting. So it's, it's been a great, um, some, some heritage there in it. And it's kind of progressed. Now I have been uh, the, the president of the Heise Glass Museum, the Heise Collectors of America, and um, served on many committees, many roles, and I'm currently the immediate past president. So um, fully enjoy Heise Glass and sharing my passion with others. Well, we're really excited to have you here tonight talking about that with us. And before we get started, I have just a couple of things I wanted to show here I'm gonna pull up. Um, there's a couple of things I really like about um, Michael's interest in glass. Um, the first is that it really goes beyond just the collecting of the items to actually a lot of the history behind it. and I've seen posts of his on Facebook or in the Heise groups where he's, you know, reading through board meeting minutes from 1937 and, um, you know, finding out about, I think there was, uh, there's like a hunting lodge or something that they had some summer meetings at and things like that. So Michael likes to dig deep into a lot of the, um, you know, behind the scenes information and has a lot of great stories to share there. And the other thing that's really important that he does and we all should be doing is sharing our love of glassware with others. So I have a picture of you right now up on the screen with uh, your son. This is probably a couple of years ago. I know he's a lot older now, but reading him a great bedtime story and educating him on the magic of high glass. So it's never too early to get your kids and interested in glassware. And that's actually what got me interested in it was having those early childhood memories of my grandmother using pink depression glass. So um, I think that really kind of forms a strong connection with people. And, you know, whether you, you have children of your own or nieces and nephews, um, if you want to kind of get this legacy to continue and have people interested in it, it's really important to kind of get them started at, at any age. And um, as if you think that was maybe a little bit too young to be knowledgeable about Heise, I have the next picture here. Oh, maybe I don't. Hold on here. Technical difficulties. Um, hold on here. See, we've encountered our first issue. Okay, hold on. Let's see if I can get this going. Um, the other great picture I have up here, if I can pull it very quickly, is that I know, Michael, you just did uh, recently a, let me see if I get the hashtag right. It's hashtag COVID cocktail challenge, correct? Correct. So we did a, uh, created kind of a fundraiser for the museum in this, co in this COVID era. Um, and yeah, there's the picture. Um, yeah. <laughs> we created cocktails out of lemon juice and um, pickle juice and it was fun to watch the kids kind of pucker and make a sour face yeah. and uh, make a donation to the museum. Um, and it shared it with several other friends and collectors and it has kind of taken off. Uh, so far it's raised just over $6,000 um, for the museum. So it's just a fun little thing to do. And uh, we can't see each other you know, in person right now with our social distancing era, but we can share fun and it was neat to see people in a video and using their glassware and, uh, you know, enjoying a good cocktail for a good cause. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, and then two other photos I have here, just I wanted to bring up really quickly for a little bit more of the Detroit connection to Heise. 
Um, I was doing some research online uh, in the last couple months here, and I ran across a couple great photos. Now, these are courtesy of the Detroit Historical Society. Um, these are used with permission, um, so I did get that from them, but I wanted to share a couple with everyone. Um, this is the 1940s um, downtown Detroit Hudson store, the China and obviously glassware department here. So you can see a great little display of um, Lariat there, um, one of the things I've noticed in a lot of the um, advertising um, that, or one of the kind of marketing tactics a lot of these companies did is they'd have um, a magazine ad that the glassware would be in and then they'd show that same cover of the magazine in the store and say, look, this glassware has been featured in Ladies Home Journal, you should most definitely own it. Um, and here's another picture, this is about a decade later from the 1950s uh, showing Again, other glassware in the background, but you can clearly see quite a bit of Heise crystallite in there. So I thought that was kind of really fun and neat to share to get our kind of conversation started this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to you in a minute, Michael. Um, I am prepared here to hydrate. I'm drinking my water. Um, it's a little bit kind of sunny in here. You can't quite see with Minuet. So I got my Minuet here. I'm Empress Sahara with sweet tea. So. I meant to make some iced tea and I forgot. If I do get a little peckish, I recently purchased these from Michael. So I have a little <laughs> swan nut cup with some almonds in it. And depending on how long the conversation goes, my water might, you know, get a touch warm. So I do have <laughs> a Heise Greek Key Hotel ice bucket here. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as you can see, is bigger than my head. So I have quite the supply of ice here to keep my beverage nice and cold as we talk today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, I, I'm really, thanks for again having me. Um, I'm excited to share um, a lot of my insight. And Heise, again, you kind of said, like, I, I am a collector. I enjoy acquiring pieces of Heise and creating a collection and, you know, the, the thrill of the hunt of finding new items. But it's more of a passion in the the creative process, how the how the items were made, the knowledge of um, the skill and labor and craftsmanship that went into to make these items that I appreciate more now. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't have a large collection <laughs> by any means, but I I don't need to necessarily go out and have every single piece of every item. It's more of just a um, appreciation for the items, and I I love the background story and how things were made and um, I love the, the factory experience. Um, I think a lot of it comes from my grandfather being there. There's just a, a love for like what they were doing in the factory and how things were made and how they were created. And, uh, so that's definitely my passion now. Um, and then also obviously the museum creating that legacy and, and hopefully, um, sustaining HCA and Heise into the future. So that's kind of, those are my two passions um, but a lot of people ask like, well, how do you know it's Heise? What, what is Heise? You know, those are like common questions. How do we tell Heise from other glassware? Um, and so Heise evolved over many years. They made so many different styles and patterns and different eras of production that it's, it's confusing to people because, um, you know, they did color era, they did colonial era, they did crystal, um, Victorian era stuff. So, you know, styles and trends changed and, so did the glassware. And so it, it, it's not like you can just look at something easily as a new person and go, Oh, well, that's Heise. You know, I, I recognize that, but if you study it and you get to know the eras of their production, it really helps to um, be able to just spot it and say, well, I think that might be Heise or, you know, here's where I would look to find a mark or so those are some things I would like to share today. Just kind of explain how vast Heise was and also hopefully help people be able to spot it or identify it. Um, so the Heise started in 1896, um, 1895, 1896. There's a little bit of speculation there on when they truly started, but 1895, um, is when the factory was, was being built and supposedly some pieces were created in 1895, but 1896 is when they, I think, truly were producing glassware. Um, so from 1895 ish to 1900 was the big Victorian press or uh, cut glass movement, you know, brilliant cut glass was all the trend was all the, um, hype and that's what, um, everybody wanted. And Heise was great at creating a very similar product at a lower cost. Um, and so he created A.H. Heise, the founder created pieces that, really looked like cut glassware, but they were pressed out. Um, and he actually used a term called plunger, um, plunger cut glassware. 
So meaning they used a plunger to press out a piece of cut glassware. So that was a big, um, these are all patterns. Um, these are all pieces from the pattern um, pinwheel and fan. So very expensive looking for the time, but they literally just pressed them out. So that was how he was able to gain his competitive edge on other glass companies um, and really got their business started well. They did have a few colors early on um, that were, you know, very uh, with the trends of the time. Uh, this is emerald and then they did gold decoration. Sometimes the gold will be on the pineapples, sometimes uh, or on the fans, sometimes they'll be on the pineapples. Um, but, and Heise did a lot of their decorations right in house, even early on. If you look at the, there's an 1895 blueprint of the factory, there is a decorating room. So a lot of people think like, oh, an outside decorating company would have bought that as a blank and decorated it. And in a lot of cases that's true, but they were also decorating their wear early, early on. Um, but we just don't know what, you know, what decor they put on it. There's no record of that that we found. So, um, but we do know that they were decorating. Um, this is a neat piece. I love this one because it actually has M Mayer on it for my name. <laughs> it's a very weird, like, humbling thing that my name is on this piece. So this is custard. Uh, it's very hard to see in this lighting, but it's a custard glass. And then um, this is a neat piece that I'm glad to have, which is a um, piece of dark emerald or like a, almost a black color. Um, this is non-production. We think it's probably just burnt out emerald that was at the end of the pot. Um, you see the cream and sugars in this. You see these little uh, bases. Um, but at this time, the Diamond H trademark had not been invented yet. So these were not marked. So these are things you could pick up and not know. You know, somebody may not know that they're Heisey, but uh, you'd uh, be able to spot it and know by the uh, patterns and the production of it. So have you drank uh, one of those before? The edges look kind of, you know, scallop there a bit. I don't know how practical it is. Well, that one, that one I wouldn't. Um, it, Just because of the rarity. Most of, the, most of them would have a, a rim around it. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't serve well that way. Um, so those were the early on pressed, uh, pressed imitation cut glass patterns that really got them started. And then uh, 1900 to 1920 was really Heise's big colonial movement. So um, colonial revival was kind of, you know, was, was high and... Um, a lot of just plain scalloped panels and flutes um, were all the trend. The Diamond H had been created. Um, and so if I can get the glare to hit it just right, you'll be able to see the Diamond H there dead in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were very proud to put their Diamond H logo on practically everything. Um, the very early Diamond Hs are very large. They were obviously showing off how about their glassware. Um, Heise was very proud of their quality, their, their quality of crystal. Um, H. Heise was almost, I don't want to say arrogant, but they were very proud of their crystal quality and clarity to the point that A.H. hated colors. He hated the emeralds and custards and those early colors because it, you were covering up the good quality of glassware when you, put, when you made color. Like you couldn't, it, it wasn't distinguishing their, their clarity and quality. So he was very proud of his crystal and wanted to show it off. And so that's why they're so, um, so much crystal heisey is that they were just so proud of it. Uh, so just trying to pull out a few specimen pieces here um, to just kind of show you the colonial eras, um, but just simple flutes and panels. That was what they were really big on for about 20 years. And they lasted much longer than that. Um, but that was really the height of it. Also the uh, soda shop wear was very popular at that time. Soda shops were just opening up. And so Heise marketed to appeal um, to them with lots of um, tumblers and, you know, soda glasses and straw jars and crushed fruit jars and candy jars and things that would, would, uh, be in those candy stores and soda shops and stuff. So um, then we move into the um, kind of the end of the 1900s. So the 19 teens, uh, Heise really was trying to, the, the colonial styles were kind of dying off and they wanted to uh, tap a new market, I guess. So they, they were still trying to have simple flutes and panels and, 
Um, you can kind of see the stem is still very plain, but they were now able to do a blown bowl with a pressed stem um, and combine those two together and, and get a very elegant and, you know, uh, not a chunky goblet. It was a very elegant, um, classical design. And so at the same time, etchings and cuttings were kind of coming very popular and the etching plate process had been developed. And so um, this is Renaissance um, etching. And this is a double plate etching that Heise did. Um, so those are those are fun, just early early etchings, and then this is an early cutting that was a Heise production cutting. Again, a very simple, plain fluted stem, um, a blown bowl, and then this is Windsor cutting. Uh, so that was kind of their starting of a new era. No more chunky colonials. Uh, just getting more more delicate and more graceful. Um, so that was the late teens and kind of introduced the, the ability to do a blown bowl and a press stem. And once they had um, gained that, then there was the opportunity to add in an optic into the blown bowl. So it gave more elegance to the bowl and, and uh, more style. So uh, if you don't know what an optic is, it's a, they blow it into a separate mold. Um, before they blow it into the shape of the, the goblet itself or whatever they're going to, if it's a base, whatever form they're going to blow it to, um, it's blown into a diamond optic or a Saturn optic or a ring optic or wide, wide optic, narrow optic, whatever design they wanted, to, wanted it to have. So this is diamond optic and it's kind of, let me grab another example here. This might show a little bit better. Um, just gives it a little patterning to the real delicate glassware. We're probably all very familiar with optics. Um, but this was something that had just been developed um, in the very early 20s. And uh, so optics um, are, were added and kind of came out, uh, created, and that, that added a new uh, appeal to the glassware, kind of dressed it up a little bit. Um, so now we're into the 1920s. Uh, the Roaring Twenties, and I, I, I don't want to give credit here, but just it, it just seems awfully weird, I guess, or ironic. Um, you know, we we all think of Depression glass colors as the pinks and the greens and the yellows, and you know, just those iconic Depression glass colors that were made in the twenties and thirties. Um, a. H. Heise was, like I said, very stern on his crystal. He hated color. Um, a. H. passed in 1922 and E. Wilson Heise um, took over presidency. So they, I, I really think that, and, and, and E. Wilson Heise had a background in chemistry. He started the, the color era at Heise, my favorite era. Um, I love the color art glass era of Heise. And I, I, I truly think that he created the, the pinks, the greens, the yellows that were in demand. Um, I, I, I really think a lot of that was inspired from Heise. Um, he took presidency in 1922 and created the colors um, flamingo, um, the flamingo pink. This is a cute little, so uh, this is actually has a flamingo label on it. They were very proud of the new colors, very hard to see, but uh, so flamingo pink. Um, and then marigold was the yellow. This was our first color. Um, this came out in 1929. It was an unstable color because they used uranium in it. Um, and it will actually get very, it will, what they call sugar or crazing. So I've got two examples here, one that's very crazed and one that's not, um, just to kind of show the difference. So it uh, just kind of gets like a crackled finish on the inside. It's very smooth on the outside. There's no, it's, it's, uh, it's very strange how it, does this, but it's always on the inside that it crazes. Now, would the value of those two pieces be the same, or would the crazed one be worth more or less? Or crazed one, I would say, is going to be worth less. Um, it's it's kind of hard to find a marigold in good condition. Uh, it, it happens, but it it definitely is always got like if you really look at it, it's got like a little like uh, just a different texture to the glass. Hmm. Um, I love marigold. I I have a large collection of it. Um, I think it's great. It's just a neat, 
uh, put it under black light, it is like radioactive. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the, the color era really kicked off in 1922. A.H. had passed, E. Wilson Heisey took over as president. Um, and I, I relate so well to, to E. Wilson Heisey. I, I really feel uh, like if, if, if I were back in the 1930s, him and I would have been like best friends. I, I just, there's a lot of things that we have in common. Um, he was very big into animals. Um, there's, I've read stories where like he would have, he had dogs and horses at the factory um, in the, in the had like stables at the back of the property. <laughs> and um, he kept his hunting dogs there. And whenever his, uh, his older brother would get mad at him or they'd get frustrated or something, they would, uh, he'd go out and, and, uh -huh. Uh, release his dogs from the factory and he'd have to go over to <laughs> East into North to chase down his dogs. It was just something funny they did. Um, so it was a very pet friendly environment before that was trendy in the 2000s here. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, and he, he had his horses at the factory um, because his wife was very allergic to horses. So he had a love for horses, but couldn't have them at home. So he, he had them at the factory. Um, he had a hunting lodge, like you'd mentioned earlier. He uh, had torn down seven uh, local log cabins and rebuilt them on a uh, homestead property or something on a on a farm, um, and built one large cabin out of these um, seven. And that was kind of his his outside of Heisey uh, life. He was very hands on. He he was the guy that would be in the factory working alongside the men. He was uh, his management style was very um, just hands on. Dig in. Uh, like I said, he was he was the chemist early on. He had a chemistry background, and he was who created a lot of the early colors. And then once he took over presidency, um, he trained Emmett Olson, who was the president or who was the uh, chemist for the rest of Heisey's um, operation. So um, I, I just it's my favorite era is is his uh, the color era and the the arc era of Heisey um, under E. Wilson Heisey's reign. So. Um, so I'll go over some of the colors of that and kind of talk a little bit about different pieces of those. So I mentioned Marigold that was made from 1929 to 1930. It only lasted one year. Um, that was advertised as a huge, um, appeal that was in several, um, dining rooms of hotels. They filled the entire dining room with this new trendy, bright, colorful color. Um, and then they realized it was unstable and they, just quit producing it. So it was only made for one year. Uh, same thing with Hawthorne. Um, it is a kind of a light purple color. Uh, mm -hmm. See if you can pick up the color tones here. So it was a, it's a beautiful color. So light pale purple, um, but it was an inconsistent color. They couldn't get it to stay a real consistent uh, color. So they, it would kind of muddy at times. So they replaced it with alexandrite, um, which is here, which we all all know and love. So, um, yeah. so alexandrite is the one of those dichoric glass colors that shifts um, depending on what lighting it's in from a pale pink to a kind of greenish blue color. Um, very desirable. Tiffin um, and uh, Cambridge, I believe, also had other colors like that as well. So. Um, and then Flamingo, uh, I showed you a few examples of this already. This was made from 1925 to 1935. And then again, you can see really see the diamond optic yeah. there. Yeah. Um, that was high, Flamingo and Moongling was Heise's longest lasting color, um, colored items. This is Moongling, um, 1925 to 1935. Uh, just a beautiful, vibrant green. Um, this is the Maltese cross ashtray. Um, again, still very boldly, I don't know if you can see it, it's still very boldly marked in the bottom center, trying to get a glare just right. But uh, still really promoting that Diamond H. I'm very proud of that quality. Um, obviously, there were things that they couldn't put a mark on. You know, with a blown bowl of uh, vessels, you know, goblets and vases and things, you can't put a Diamond H on something that they were hand blowing. Um, so that was where a, a paper label would come into play. Um, and this is an example of that here where uh, this was a blown item and it has a nice early blue uh, Heise's paper label on it. So 
Um, those do exist. They're still out there, but you know, most of the time they were washed off or someone peeled them off. I've heard people say, well, it was distasteful if you left the label on it back then. So <laughs> of course people peeled them off and removed them. So yeah, I have a couple of pieces that, you know, I, you can't you like, let's say if you have um, six size tea glasses, but one has a label, I had to buy a seventh because I couldn't take the label off. I mean, I want a couple of pieces that have the, the sticker on them still. <laughs> yep. Um, and then Sahara is what replaced Marigold. Um, and it's a golden yellow color, very beautiful. Um, and this was such, this was probably Heise's most consistent color. It's very uniform. Uh, all the pieces and this you can see this has a wide optic um, just kind of like wide panels and this is a uh, ball base uh, we talked about alexandrite um, so that was those were the real colors of the the early 20s 30s um, really the the e wilson heise era of colors um, they, the later colors were a tangerine which is a reddish orange. This was a struck color. So it meant that uh, what the, the formula when it came out of the glass, when it came out of the pot and they pressed it into an item, it would be, it, it almost looked just like marigold. It was a yellow, kind of an orangey yellow color. And the, how they got it to a red orange is they had to reheat it back into the glory hole. So they had to punt it or have a, a snap foot um, that they would stick it back into the furnace. Um, reheat it and so a lot of times the edges get more of a reddish hue whatever was like a lighter or a, um, lesser thick piece of glass um, it would get redder because of the heat it, it absorbed more of the heat and so it turned red quicker um, this is a vase that uh Heise made these this is this one is not Heise um, it, this fools a lot of people and that's why I kind of wanted to show this I actually there's one reason why I have it is because it's um, it's a high, it's a ivy base, um, and Heise made these, but we didn't realize until probably five years ago that these are actually not Heise. They did Heise did make these, but they're completely they're a little bit different um, on the top of the neck. And if you get on our Facebook page, you can see like side by side comparisons um, of the differences. But uh, these have been sold many many times as a Heise tangerine ivy base and they really are not. They're a modern, um, I think they were made in the 90s. Um, so it still has the, looks just like Heise's Tangerine, the kind of reddish orange. And Tangerine was made from uh, 30, 1932 to 1935. And then Cobalt Blue, everybody loves Cobalt Blue, and Heise made a brilliant dark blue. I mean, this almost looks black on the screen. Um, <laughs> but it, you can kind of catch little glimpses of the blue there. Um, very deep, dark cobalt blue. Um, you couldn't make these today. The, the EPA would shut you down if you were trying to make this deep, dense of a cobalt color um, because of the raw ingredient mineral of the cobalt. Uh, this was made from 1933 to 1941. And it was very popular uh, for Great Wild for Heise. They combined it with crystal a lot of times, um, crystal and blue. Uh, it just really accents it and kind of gets a great contrast. So it was kind of the best of the both worlds. You got, you could still highlight your great quality crystal and have, have a little bit of color at the same time. Absolutely. Um, and they did a, Heise did a lot of that where they would combine colors um, or, you know, color with crystal. This is another one where the, the foot is crystal, but the bowl um, is flamingo. So they were trying to do that. There was some inconsistencies with formulas and I don't, today we, we know so much more about glassware and glass making than they did in the twenties and thirties. You know, they were, uh, I don't know that they truly knew all of the, um, there's, you know, the glass cools differently, different types of glass cools down differently. And when they um, are stuck together and this one cools slower than this one, they're going to fracture when in the annealing process. So um, they definitely tried to experiment with, with color combinations, but I think there was some, some inconsistencies um, and it they really stuck with crystal whenever they were color combining so there's some weird examples out there of colors that you know they were playing around with and trying to figure it out um, that have survived but it's kind of a neat neat thing now so also in the 
20s, 30s, a big thing was Heise was very proud that they were able to acquire, um, they had a worker who worked for them and had a relative who inherited the sandwich glass models and molds from Massachusetts. So sandwich glass, like one of the founding glass companies in um, America, this Heise worker just inherited all the molds and models of, from them. And so um, they were, you know, Mr. Heise bought them and used them as inspiration for early American uh, glassware inspired from a time gone by, you know, and so they recreated lots of patterns that were made in colors um, during that reign. And some of those are um, old sandwich, obviously sandwich glass. So um, that is one that they had made. And this is a, this is a good example of, um, you know, you would think this piece would be marked on the center bottom, but it's not. It's actually up here. I don't know if I can get it to show up, but it's actually like right here by my finger and the hidden in the stem. And that's, that's one of the things that I love about Heise and I think has added to Heise's appeal for so long um, is that it's not only the thrill of the hunt to find a piece of Heise, but then you're like, you're looking for the mark. You're like, it's like a little <laughs> treasure hunt, you know? It's kind of like, um, you know, these days, the artists will have, you know, all these Easter eggs and their music videos and stuff. So it's like, buy the, buy the stem and find where the mark's hidden on it. Yeah. Yep. And I, I think that has really uh, helped the markability and um, collectability of, of Heise is that there's usually some provenance there that you got to like try to find. So that's, it's just a fun thing. Um, again, the very, uh, stippled patterns were kind of very early sandwich glass, uh, designs. And these were, this is an oak leaf coaster and kind of has that stippled base. Um, that was very, uh, sandwich glass. This is a good example. This Eagle plate in moon gleam, um, that has a great stippling to it. But this, these are things that they were creating kind of new trends, um, trying to appeal to a new market. And then Ipswich um, was another one that they created. This is the candle vase. And it has kind of a, um, this was, Comet was the pattern from Sandwich Glass. So it came with the, you could either display flowers or you could put a, this, piece here in it and the candle cup and do the uh, candle in it. So kind of a practical early piece. So what were these, was there any like controversy when these came out? I mean, nowadays I think that, you know, I mean, if Moss or Glass or somebody were to take all the Heise molds and start producing it in mass without marking it or anything, there'd be outrage in the community. Was, was there any outrage in the NT community over when this happened? Not that I've ever seen. Um, that's a good question. I've never seen or heard of that. Um, I don't know that it was, I don't know that anybody really cared back then. You know, it was mm -hmm. just, it was just glassware. It was just something to use. And um, I, I've never heard of that. I do know that the molds and models, um, they were, Heise was sending them when they were very proud to have gotten their hands on these molds. I mean, it was kind of like a, a trade secret, you know, they, they won up on the other, on the competition, mm -hmm. you know, they had these models to, to be inspired by and, and create these new patterns. Um, and they were sending them on the road to, to go to a, either a department store or show them off at some exhibit or something. And somehow they were lost in transit. Oh no. Uh, so, so, so very few of them still exist. We do have a few at the museum that have somehow survived, um, but not many. And I don't know, um, we, we do have photographs of them when they, from Heise, so we know like what they were, um, but they were just wooden models that kind of showed like what they were creating. And it was a wooden model they would have made the mold from. It's what they would have made the, the sand casting from to, do, to actually produce the mold. So, um, yeah, so they were actually lost. So I don't know, it's kind of, they could still be out there somewhere. So I, you have like a missing know. persons report. If you know where these are, if you've seen them in a friend's <laughs> basement, call Michael. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've gone through the kind of the color era. Um, now we're getting into the kind of the, the late 30s, early 40s. And again, um, we've, the, so, okay, let me back up a little bit. So 1929, the stock market crashed. Um, you know, the 1930s prohibition was going on. Um, it was, it was definitely a hard time for E. Wilson. There was a lot of struggles. 
Um, his employees were struggling with the Great Depression. And all that I've ever heard um, about the factory, about the, the Heise family and their uh, management of the factory and their employees is that they were great um, to, their, to their workers. People stayed there because um, they were treated with dignity. They were treated with respect. Um, heard stories of um, E. Wilson Heise uh, during the Depression. Uh, people didn't have enough money to heat their houses, and you know they were they they were cold. And so he had a train car delivered with coal, and said, "Whoever needs coal, go go take some and take it home." Um, that was just one of the great things that um, they did for their people, and that's really why I think I I hear so many good things about uh, the the you know anybody that has ever worked for or anybody that had a grandpa that worked for. Um, was always always hear great things about the the company, so that's just a great thing I, I, that I love. Um, so we're kind of transitioning here. The prohibition had ended, um, and it was well, well during so during prohibition. Sorry, uh, Heise had to get kind of creative in their marketing. So they uh, created items for alcoholic use, and then all of a sudden prohibition hit, and it's like, oh, what are we going to do? We can't sell. Uh, you know, we can't sell decanters anymore. We can't sell barware anymore. Um, it was illegal to, to do so. So they created things like martini pitchers, uh, quickly got renamed in catalogs to tomato juice pitchers. Uh, sherbets got, or I'm sorry, uh, champagnes became sherbets and barware became sodas. So it was they were still producing glassware for the bar. They were just renaming it. So uh, I think that's a really fun, uh, creative way that it's just a neat little pocket of history that we, we know what they were doing, but uh, it was it's a great thing. Um, so about that same time that prohibition was going on, um, just before the 1940s, uh, a new etching uh, discovery had been found and that was the deep plate etchings. Um, so they had taken, um, very similar to, it was still a plate etching, um, but this is a, basically they just left this in the acid longer to, to etch the design in it. It's very, very rough, thick, deep. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very deep plate etch. <laughs> um, and they, Heise was the one that created this. Um, they patented the, uh, the, invention for it and they made several designs in it uh, mermaids this is fox chase etch which is one of my favorites um and again kind of the, the heisey family had a love for horses they were at the factory um e wilson was a big uh farm guy and obviously had horses his brother t clarence we'll talk a little bit more about and his love for for high for uh, horses but um that was kind of the new trend and a lot of those were kind of fell in with the tangerine and cobalt era, the thirties, um, late, late thirties, early forties, um, was the deep plate etchings. So then, uh, Heise got into, they had hired Emo Crawl to come to Heise, um, to start, uh, producing elaborate cuttings on glassware. Heise was very, uh, very elite in their marketing and their, um, Again, they were just very proud of their wear, and they tried to do the best that they possibly could and, and make the best product. And uh, they hired the best and advertised with the best. And um, so they, they hired Emil Kral uh, to come and basically work for them to create um, elaborate cuttings for glassware. And if you know the process of a cutting, it's like a stone wheel that just engraves the glassware. And it's just insane that that is all done by hand. Um, a fun little story that I've heard is that, you know, we think of ML crawl as this great master cutter and how, you know, uh, nobility and just like, he was just a renowned artist and all these great things about him. And not that he wasn't great. I'm not trying to say that at all, but, uh, the workers that worked beside him that were, you know, cutters didn't care for him. Um, and it wasn't because of his personality. It wasn't because of him. It was that they didn't like that 
he got to sit and play around all day and create these cuttings. And they were practically like strapped to a, a wheel bench and were, they were doing production while he was yeah. creating yeah. things. So um, they didn't understand why he just got to play all day and they were just doing the same thing repetitively. So um, just kind of a fun story about the, the worker's life and their interactions. Um, so the thirties, forties was big on, on cuttings and, uh, also etchings were popular. Uh, Heise created probably their most well-known etching, uh, orchid etch. Many people are, well, I think this is probably one of Heise's longest lasting designs and really this was a, appealed to so many people as wedding gifts. Uh, many times I will go in and, you know, buy collections or, you know, be, uh, someone inherited a bunch of glassware and these, you know, they got a barrel of this, uh, their grandparents got a barrel of this for their wedding crystal in 1948, or um, it was just a very highly desirable uh, pattern at the time. And they put orchid on a lot of stuff. <laughs> it was a very, mm -hmm. it, it definitely was their um, saving grace in the late thirties, early forties. Cambridge had their Rose Point, Heise had their Orchid, Fostraria had their American, everyone kind of had their bread and butter pattern. <laughs> Correct. Um, so then we're going into the late, or into the, the 40s. Um, it was a war era. You know, we weren't into the war uh, quite yet, but it was definitely, supplies were hard to get. Um, we, we entered into more, the, the Depression era colors were, were no longer a, a high demand. And so they, they entered back into crystal uh, Items cobalt was the one that really surpassed. But they again, they always kind of put it with crystal. So um, you kind of got a little bit of color there, but for the most part, they went back to a more simple crystal-based formulas and um, cuttings and etchings accented um, the items. And then once we really hit into the war era, um, they were just cranking out, just pressing out pieces. So whatever there was, they were trying to limit the amount of hand labor. Um, a lot of men were off at the war, and so there were women in the factory pressing glass out. We've got great pictures of women in, you know, dresses and aprons and stockings and, and you know, next to a fiery furnace, you know, pulling the plunger down, pressing out pieces of glassware. And so um, a lot of very uh, easily pressed out pieces, lariat, uh, crystallite, like you saw in the, the big display um, in Detroit that, that you had, Jonathan, Crystallite, Lariat, uh, Ridgely, and uh, Saturn were big pressable patterns that were easily made um, that didn't require a lot of skill or craftsmanship or really just tooling. It was just something they could press out, move it on, um, and still be a marketable item. Heise also, you know, again, I think the they went back to a crystal based formula because they couldn't necessarily get a lot of cobalt. They couldn't get a lot of the raw minerals from overseas because there was such a, you know, not a trade war, but the, the, um, you know, they, they couldn't get things from other countries. So one of those things was, you know, there was a shortage of metal and your typical prism that you would have on, on items, a little uh, a style prism, these, have metal in them and they also were most of them were brought in from Czechoslovakia so they couldn't import those anymore and so Heise got really creative and they made their own um, hmm. this is a solid glass prism that doesn't it's not a two-piece um, and it only has one little metal loop here um, that you can see there so very little metal and still got the same effect and they made about six different prisms um, these are two of those they're all prisms have letters given to them. So there's A, B, C, D, E. I don't recall which ones these are, but um, they're pretty neat. And uh, so the 40s were going on. Uh, in 1942, E. Wilson Heise died, um, and kind of so did the, the color era. So um, we harken back to the simpler times. T. Clarence Heise was the next president. Um, his personality was completely different than, than E. Wilson. He was more of the businessman. Um, you know, I, I look at photos of the factory and 
you know, you would see E. Wilson in the factory with, you know, uh, with overalls or um, just in like work clothes. And then you see photos of T. Clarence and he's in a suit and tie and a flower lapel on his, on his jacket. <laughs> like he's completely different, um, which was, again, not a bad thing, just completely different management style. And uh, T. Clarence was more business minded, more of a numbers guy. Um, and one of his big passions was um, equestrian ship and horses. And that's really what created the Heise Animal Series. This was the first, um, the first animal made, uh, supposedly designed by T. Clarence Heise. So this is the Horsehead Bookend. Oh, this was made in 1941. These sold so well, apparently, that they decided to make more animal figurines that became very popular. Um, and again, they were very easy to just press out. Um, they did have to grind and polish the, the bust off off the bottom, but it was very minimal work. So those became very popular. Um, this is a the ringneck pheasant, and I love the ringneck pheasant in that uh, I heard a story recently that I was buying a collection from somebody here locally. And I, I love to ask people whenever I'm buying from a local NERC person and they have a, a large collection, I'm like, where did you get this? Was this a family thing? Did somebody work at the factory? Um, Cause you can, you can gain a lot of information just from the locals on stuff. And um, they had a few pheasants and they said, well, we're very proud to, to still have these because um, my grandfather always told us stories that, they when they made these they loved the guys loved to they would take the seconds the guys in the at the factory would take the seconds of the pheasants and they would sling them at the train cars as they went by because you could hang on to the tail <laughs> and just sling it you know out yeah. and they would love to just watch them shattered on the train cars as, as the train cars went by so um that was a great story uh kind of a sad one but it's that that is totally what what it was here in Newark. It was just glassware. It was a job. It was a, it was a great job, right. um, but it was just glass. And um, I've heard people say, you know, we were so poor that we had to play with Heisey animals as kids, you know, and it's just so, <laughs> so funny now to think of that. Like some of these animals are literally worth thousands of dollars and you were so poor, you got to play with them as a kid, you know. Um, the I've heard stories of the, the workers in the factory taking the bowls and literally like ramming them together until they broke, um, you know, and that's a, a probably a $1,500 animal today. So it's just, <laughs> it's just a neat, neat piece of how, how things have changed and where they were in that time. Do you have um, any idea for the, like at the height of production, uh, roughly how many people were employed by the factory? At the height, it was about 600. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would have been the height was in the twenties and thirties, the, the, the E. Wilson era. Um, yeah, that, that is, which is, which is huge. Um, yeah. that was a, that was a huge amount of people at that time. Um, and, and A.H. Heisey came to Newark. He chose Newark, Ohio because of, there was like four reasons that he came to Newark, which was there was natural gas there for the furnaces. There was a local supply of silica sand. Um, the railroad was here so he could bring the raw materials in and then ship the, the wear out. Um, the, the, the railroad literally is right in front of the factory and Nork had a labor force. And I never understood like, what do you mean they had a labor force? Like they had a workforce, like, and what it was, was, you know, 1890, we were transitioning from the industrial revolution. So things were going from farmland to factories and production. And so there was a bunch of farm kids out there with nothing to do. Their farms were being bought up, houses were, you know, uh, communities were being built. And there was still a lot of farm hands out there that needed something to do. They weren't farming the land. And so they were just farm kids that needed a job. And so we had a high, high amount of labor that Mr. Heisey was able to tap into. So, but that was never understood what that meant. Like we had a high labor force, but it was just a bunch of farm kids. <laughs> That's what it was. Um, so back to the, the 1940s, um, they were trying to, after the war, they were trying to get a more modern and, and their colors and designs. And uh, one of those was Whirlpool. Um, and this is in the color Zircon, which was made in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, 
This was designed and T. Clarence Heisey really didn't like the pattern. He, he thought it was really obnoxious and didn't care for it. Um, and so he nicknamed it cesspool instead of whirlpool. Um, and there's a great story of, you know, I can picture a receptionist typing, you know, he's talking to her telling, you know, she's typing up what he's saying to send out this letter to the salesman. And he was so used to calling it cesspool that he said cesspool. Um, and she typed it, but luckily they caught it before they sent it and changed it to whirlpool quickly. <laughs> so it's just a neat, neat so I, I jokingly refer to it as cesspool. Um, quite often just to kind of keep that alive, but it's a neat little story. Um, and again, they were getting more, trying to get more modern and styles and trends change. This is cabochon. So very uh, square on round pattern, very just plain, simple, more modern fifties. Um, and this is neatly marked here on the side. If I can get, if I can get the glare just right. Um, so, you know, not always on the center bottom. So that kind of mm -hmm. fun, find the, find the diamond H. Again, optics, we're still, this is a more modern optic. This is impromptu or belly button optic. Um, what's really weird is the molds for this optic are called bird's eye optic, but I've never heard it referred to as that. So I don't know where that came from. Um, it makes sense with like bird's eye maple. I, I see the naming of it, but I've, I've never heard it referred to as that. So I'm, it's a little mystery for me. Um, they also were, were again, colors and styles changing. Uh, this was another late pattern um, or color, Dawn, more of like a smoke glass color. Um, again, this was marketed at one point as a martini pitcher. Um, and then later, I believe it was changed to a milk pitcher or a, um, it, it had a different name that they changed it to um, from, from early on to, to later. And then they created a honey amber color. This is a little sparky horse um, in Heisey's honey amber. And very few animals were made in this color. This one looks like the workers just literally, you know, beat him up as well. He's missing his tail. The front of his base is all chipped out, but I, I love it just because it's, it just shows, it just tells that story that it was used and abused and it was just glass. Um, you know, this guy would probably be five or $600 or more if he were perfect, but he's far from it. So I, I just, I just like that. Um, so in the fifties, Heisey was really trying to modernize things. They hired Ava Zeisel. Um, who was a renowned designer. She went off to be more pottery based than glass based, but she um, was a new trendy designer who uh, really kind of streamlined things for Heise and kind of marketed them to a different appeal. Um, this was the, the Saturn hostess helper trying to, you know, help, help out the hostess of the 1950s, you know, and these were uh, little bar glasses that they made into toothpick holders to hold your, to, pick your fruit or uh, shrimp or whatever you wanted to serve in this. And these little metal clips come out. So they were just totally trying to appeal to the 1950s housewife. Um, and a lot of things changed and just kind of got str more streamlined. This is probably one of the last items that Heisey made. This is a twisted stem uh, goblet. Um, it's got a neat little paper label on it that, has like it's uh, it was just basically a sample I think I've never seen this label on many other pieces but uh, these were one of the last items made in the 1950s uh, so Heise did close in 1957 much like I mean you know many of the other glass houses were closing at the same era the late 50s early 60s uh, they just couldn't compete with uh, the, the imports coming in from, from overseas and labor prices went up. Another thing that um, a lot of people don't know is that um, Heise initially owned all the gas and oil well rights for the furnaces. So that was, it was a free gas bill to them. They, they owned the rights. They, they had all control over it. But as, as families developed and the Heise family, um, you know, got larger and kids and um, I guess some relatives 
wanted their share of, or they wanted to buy out their, their share and wanted the money from it. And so they had to sell off lots of the, the, uh, the oil rights. And so they no longer owned it. They, they had to sell it. So that put a burden or a cost now on the, the, the gas. And so it, it, it hurt. Um, so that's just one more element that I don't think a lot of people know, but it's, it's was definitely a, um, a struggle for them. So Heise did close December of 1957. Um, it was actually Christmas. They shut down for Christmas break and did not reopen. So um, kind of a sad tale to such a great glass company. Um, I think they knew they were going to shut down, but they didn't really know. I think the, the Christmas break was just kind of, okay, it's shut down. We're, we're, we're there. Let's just not reopen. Um, they did not tell the workers um, that they, they weren't going to have a job coming back after Christmas. And yet I've never heard anything like negative about that. Like my, my grandfather was one of those people that lost his job and I've never from the family ever heard like that, that was wrong of them to do. I think they just, I think they saw it coming, you know, they, they knew they were struggling and they just accepted it. But, um, just a hard, hard challenge there toward the end as all the glass houses had, um, so I've talked plenty, Jonathan. What <laughs> what questions, or do you want to like recap on something here, or like what questions do you have for me? Or uh, this is gonna be fun because we haven't we haven't practiced or um, rehearsed any of this. So I can just ask you. I it complete you know like stump Michael now. <laughs> um, no, I think this is very great and informative to kind of give everyone an overview of you know just all the the great production that Heisey had. I guess one of the things that popped into my mind is when you showed the um, Ipswich candle holder with the, um, you know, the prison base with a candle insert, obviously, you know, Heisey, I mean, I have a one etched minuet. So is that kind of, that design is what inspired them to create other molds and variations of that? Correct. Heisey was very big on changing, um, they would reuse molds, you know, they, they already had a mold and let's just say the, um, um, something would go out of style. So a colonial pattern would go out of style um, and they weren't producing this anymore. And so they would take it and rework the mold and put the, the old sandwich punties, little circles on it and rework a mold. Um, they did that a lot. And I, I think that was, I know they didn't remake uh, the Ipswich piece into the Revere one that you have with Minuet, but it certainly probably inspired it. Um, the biggest difference with it is that the Revere one very coolly has the holes for flower stems to go through where the Ipswich one does mm -hmm. not. It's literally a candle or nothing. Um, so I love that the Revere one, you can display flowers and a candle or just flowers or, um, or just a candle. So a little bit more practical, but yeah, Heise was great at recreating, um, making new patterns from old ones. This is a great example. This is a, um, Saturn goblet with the Saturn optic in it here. And I actually have, um, I'll show you here in just a minute, I have the Saturn optic that this was probably made from. But this initially would have been just a plain bowl or a diamond optic bowl that they would have, this would have been part of the Revere or Yeoman pattern, um, but they just gave it a new optic and it became a new pattern. Um, and they did that with a, a lot of the Revere or Yeoman plain items uh, became Saturn and and many other things like that occurred. They they were great at improvising and changing uh, patterns to make new ones to, to try to compete and uh, make a new demand. But uh, me, so I'll, after this, I'll kind of dive into like why I have this because I totally have yeah. the the uh, this is an optic mold. So this is Saturn optic. Um, and it, it actually is called ring optic on here. Again, I don't know why they have different names. So bird's eye optic versus um, impromptu or belly button. Uh, this one says ring optic. So this is what the glass would have been blown into first and then blown into the form shape um, of the bowl to give it that, that patterned optic design. So, now the reason why I have a Heise mold sitting in my basement next to me yeah. here. That was that's actually my next question is so the factory closes, what happens to all the assets, the molds, the building itself, where, where does all that go to? So 
AH Heise or uh, the, the Heise company closes 1957. Um, they had a liquidation auction. We have the photos in our archives, which are really cool, where they went around and just took photos of the equipment and things that they were uh, selling off. But in 1958, Imperial, um, which you got to remember, 1957, it was Christmas of 1957. In 1958, literally a few, you know, a few months probably later, uh, Imperial Glass of Bellaire, Ohio, purchased um, all remaining assets of the um, A.H. Heise and Company. So they bought the molds, they bought the formulas, they bought the equipment, they, they bought everything but the factory. They even bought unfulfilled orders. So there were still um, unfulfilled orders for Orchid Etch um, in 1957. So this was a pattern that came out in 1942. It was still popular in 1957 and Imperial bought the unfulfilled orders. So they had to create Orchid Etching and fulfill those orders. So um, all the molds, all the assets, everything moved down to the Ohio border um, and Imperial was producing many items um, early on. You know, they bought everything. They bought the trademark, the Diamond H. They were producing items with the Diamond H trademark in it. Luckily, um, they used a different glass formula. So it's, it, it for the most part, I, I trust it. It, uh, if you black light it, Imperial glows kind of a dull blue and Heise fluoresces kind of a, uh, kind of a limish green kind of color. So again, you can see some of those on our, on our Heise Facebook page, if you want to see like photos of it, but most of those are in the animals um, where people are concerned because Imperial did make a lot of the Heise animals. The things that Imperial was making um, that really kept them in business were the animals. Um, Old Williamsburg, a colonial pattern, which I don't have an example of. Um, and Orchid Etch, they were, again, they were fulfilling those orders and they were still making Orchid Etching. So, and a lot of the workers left Heise and went in, to Imperial to show them how to use the molds, how to use the etching plates, how to, you know, how they did their, how they did their job. Um, and so luckily HCA, um, was founded and several of our early members kind of got with Imperial um, business owners and things. And they, I don't say persuaded them, but they, they made it very well known that they wanted them to remove the Diamond H trademark from things. They wanted to be able to sustain and um, keep that, that Diamond H trademark off of things that was going to hurt the value or hurt the integrity of, of Heise. And they listened. Imperial was very, very good with us. Um, not only did they um, remove the Diamond H from several things, they created their own Imperial mark and put on the mold. So they, they marked their own items eventually. They also were making, you know, this was in the 1970s, uh, color trends were completely different. So browns and avocado greens and uh, purples and those were more trendier colors. Um, and so that's what they were producing. So it was nothing like Heise's colors. So, um, Imperial also met its uh, demise in 1984. They closed, and fortunately, the Heise Collectors of America was able to purchase all of the molds um, from Imperial, all of them except for the 341 Old Williamsburg line. Um, so all the animal molds, all of the, anything that existed um, other than 341 Old Williamsburg, HCA now owns and we store in a warehouse um, and I am the very proud little fortunate person that gets to oversee the warehouse and it's really humbling to me because my uh, my great-grandfather was Heise's mold foreman um, and so now I kind of oversee those same molds and it's um, just really humbling to to be there and be able to move and care for the same molds that he did um, and so I have this Saturn optic mold in my basement now because I had it in my truck to return to the warehouse um, because I sit on the board for the Heise Museum. We make um, limited reproductions. I'm in charge of all of our projects for the museum and um, our newest one is our ornament um, and we had it made with a Saturn optic um, and so I picked up the ornaments the other day from our artist and he obviously had the mold to make the Saturn optic and was just thought it would be a neat thing while we were sharing the video to just go ahead and 
capture and show off what an optic mold really looked like. We all know what optics are, I think, but it's neat to see the actual piece. So, so are those ornaments going to be for sale? So these will be for sale starting in June, June 1st. These will be released. Um, they were supposed to be for our convention, which was yeah. sadly canceled. Um, but we're going to go ahead and, you know, they're obviously made. Um, so the sales will continue. Um, so these will be available June 1st um, on our website. Uh, we'll be marketing them on Facebook. But basically, uh, call the museum and place your order. Um, they're, they're really cool. So, yeah. so if you're uh, watching this video live on June 1st, it's probably about... 8.30 p.m. tomorrow, so the first thing you should do tomorrow morning on Tuesday is call the Heising Museum up or go on the website and place your order. Absolutely. 740-345-2932 is their number. <laughs> there we go. He's got it memorized. Now, when was the Heise Collectors of America founded? 1971, uh, HCA, the Heise Collectors of America, was founded, um, and then the museum uh, was purchased, moved, and, and started. Um, in 1973, is that right? Yeah, 1973, the museum was was moved there. Um, so HCA was formed 1971, so next year will be our 50th anniversary, which is like crazy. Um, so it's a great organization. It's been around for now 50 years. Um, I'm proud to try to carry on the legacy and the appreciation for Heise and um, sustain HCA. Um, so what does it mean to be a member? Um, it, it means that you are supporting the organization. It means that you're um, a dedicated member and um, it's $30 a year for your, for your membership. And what's that get you? That gets you updated information, um, what's going on in the collector's organization, gets you info to limited reproductions to the ornaments, kind of gets you firsthand knowledge of that. You also get uh, 12 monthly issues of the Heise News mailed to you. Um, there's an electronic form or a uh, paper form. It's a great, um, great uh, educational piece and also just a thing to keep you up to date on what's going on in the Heise world. If there's anything, um, you know, being released, if there's anything that going on that's uh, unscrupulous that we're trying to make sure our members are protected from. So. Um, it's a great resource. Um, also gives you um, a 10% discount on in the museum shop once you're a member um, on certain items. So it's a great thing just to, to be a member to support the organization, but um, a lot of fellowship and um, camaraderie comes with it. Yeah, I got one, one picture. This is just one of many, many rooms at the museum here. Um, I did have the chance to visit it on a couple occasions and it's you know definitely a great road trip to make. Um, I think from the Detroit area here, it's probably about like three hours or so. Um, so, I mean, definitely doable as a day trip, but my personal recommendation is that um, you come down for the Heise Museum and then, you know, Cambridge is only another hour away and then Fostoria is just a little beyond that. So you make, you know, a couple days of it and see several of the museums, but it, it's really great to see a collection like this. And, um, you know, you got to get a little bit of, you know, the history tonight of what Michael was talking about. But in, in addition to seeing all the different patterns and colors, there's just amazing things to see at the museum. I mean, they have the um, massive mold that made the Greek key punch bowl set on display and, you know, workers tools. And um, there's a great, you know, reference, reference library for members uh, to look through resources and things, but just the amount of, um, you know, really taking you back through the production and all these tools and everything that, and, you know, photographs of the factory. It's just a really great experience to see beyond the glass or um, all that was involved in uh, creating this. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we, Central Ohio is kind of the heart of glass production. So I, I agree, make it be a, a day trip or a weekend trip and, and try to hit all the, the local glass house, you know, all the, Glass Museum is here. Um, Cambridge is not that far. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, Michael. It was very, very much appreciated. I'm sure not only the MDGS members who watched learned a lot, but you know this video will continue to get views as it's up on YouTube on demand. So hopefully we'll be educating a lot of other people about Heise and we'll put up those links for visiting the museum, um, joining the Heise Collectors of America. And um, just again, wanna thank you so much for your time. And um, I know this took a lot of effort. I mean, you had a great outline together. 
I believe this cabinet is in, is in, in this exact order, so you kind of pulled this all together for the presentation. So I know you spent a lot of time and effort for that, and we really, really appreciate it. Not a problem. It's easy to do when you enjoy what you do. <laughs> it's yeah. a passion. It's not, it's not work. <laughs>